All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk, episode number 703 today. And uh, I'm pretty fired up about today's episode because, uh, first of all, introduce yourself, guys. Hey, I'm uh, M Shadows, and I uh, sing in Avenged Sevenfold. Hi, I'm Johnny Christ. I'm also in Avenged Sevenfold. And yeah. a podcaster. And a yeah, podcast, a yes. podcaster. I mean, that's yeah. why you look beautiful. I mean, that's... <laughs> that's why I got the golden mic, baby. He's got it <laughs> set up back there, the bar. <laughs> I actually Love like your bar. background. I like your, is that like a, that's awesome. That's your background mid, is, it's surreal. Mid -century. I'm, I'm way yeah. into mid-century, you know, our architecture, design, uh, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I, I guess because I lived in just shitty boxes all my life, you know, of apartments. <laughs> you just thrive for glass and light, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> like well, I you heard you talking. Yeah. Uh, I heard you talking on your podcast last week and you were talking about how you want to get rid of all your rock posters and move on to uh, something similar to that background, but like in real life, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this time where you collect posters in your career playing music. I'm sure you've got like thousands. When you're first out on the road, you're like, oh God, my name's on this poster. Oh, we played this festival or whatever. And then you get them all home and you have an apartment and you're like, well, they cost like 500 to frame. I can put up like five or six of them. And then after a while, you just put them in a closet and tubes. And then you've got like 600 tubes. And then you go, you know what? I'm I'm more into art and classic black and white photography, like stuff. Uh, like I love rock photography, like the famous guys from the 70s that shot all these great people, you know? And um, that's the stuff I'm into now instead of posters. And you know, I don't want posters in my house. Yeah. Do you have a wife? No. See, I have a wife. So she just threw it all out. <laughs> oh. Oh. is it not in the warehouse is, is some of that stuff not in the warehouse Matt? oh i don't know she'll claim that it's somewhere but it's not anywhere it's uh. it's gone <laughs> so that took care of all my uh you know posters and names on stuff it's just i've got like one thing left i think johnny remember when we did the iron maiden tour in like 2008 and they they signed these huge posters for us with our name. Yeah, the somewhere know, back in time name. tour that we did with them. Yeah, yeah I have, yeah, it. I have one in my studio. The only thing too. I have left It's just sitting in my bathroom, my own, you know, studio bathroom. And like my wife hasn't made her way in there yet, but I'm sure she'll, you know, one day take that too. But yeah, that's all I got. Well, I, I, that's why I have it in my tour. studio because she doesn't, my, my wife doesn't go in the studio. I, she wants I, nothing I, I do to do it. with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How great was that tour, man? Somewhere I saw the original one, and then I saw the years later that the one you're talking about. It's just mm -hmm. that's a mind-boggling record and and period in time for Maiden, you know? Yeah, we, you know, we um it was a learning experience for us. You know, we got asked to go on that tour, and we actually got asked by them and we got asked by Guns N' Roses um to do their European tours. And somehow we figured out a way to toggle them both. So we would do we would fly like to GNR, then we'd fly to Iron Maiden and we were going back and forth. Um, but the Iron Maiden audience, you know, is notoriously tough, yeah. especially when um, you got these like pretty boys from Southern California that are on MTV <laughs> in America. And we, we were in makeup at the time too. Yeah, yeah. We think, we're, <laughs> we think we're cool and we go out there to a stadium and everyone's just got their arms crossed and just getting, you know, bologna sandwiches thrown at you like in Italy and stuff. So um, we... Uh, we all shaved our heads and we got crazy on stage and we had lots of feedback in between songs to make sure people couldn't yell at us. And, um, you know, we have lots of stories from that tour, but it was a huge learning experience. And it also, you know, put us in the shoes of openers, which, you know, having empathy and trying to make sure that your opening act, uh, it feels good and knows what's happening. You know, like that the audience isn't always a reflection of, necessarily the band or how their career is going to go. Um, so we always try to be really positive um, with our opening acts. Cause we know that they were iron maiden was very cool to us. Like we'd go backstage and Steve Harris would be like, you guys are awesome. This is great. Just, just, you know, that's a tough audience, but just play it and just do it. And so, you know, you learn a lot. That's, that's stuff you can't really um, prepare for. You just have to go do it and get stuff thrown at you. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, Metallica did it. Yeah. They go to Donington and just get 400 piss bottles and mud and sneakers and shit. You know, people are willing to sacrifice walking home with their feet, no <laughs> shoes. That's how angry they are at the opener. Fuck these guys. Here's my converse. <laughs> That's the yeah. that's that was the old joke we had going around of, of of the generations of haters that that were coming to these shows. Like they yeah. bring their kid and be like, "You you take off that shoe, son, and you throw it at that opening band. I don't yeah. care who it is, you know." <laughs> well, we would we would sit out. I remember we were sitting outside the Percy in uh, Paris, and we were playing with Maiden, and we were you know in our little van, and um, we were opening that tour, and we were watching everyone walk in, and it's a lot of fathers and grandfathers with their younger kids, and we're like, yeah that kid's going to be on that dad's shoulder and he's going to throw a shoe at us tonight. And then, <laughs> you know, it's going to be sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you earned your stripes in the heavy metal. You, you threw a shoe at the opener and we were just making so much fun of it. Just yeah, whatever. It is what it is. It was fun though. By the end, by uh, I'd say about a weekend, we started to ease in because uh, uh, in Europe specifically in Iron Maiden, I feel like they must've just been riding the trains, Matt. Cause there was like the same, five front rows at every fucking show with the same five front rows of people. Oh yeah. Those are, those are people that just Iron Maiden goes on tour. They're going to every show. Yeah. It was, it was remarkable to see another learning experience too, to see like, like how crazy that fan can be. But like, by the end, you know, we got those first five rows to kind of like come around and then, and then the other rows slowly came around too. It, 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 by the end of it, I felt pretty good about it, but I mean, it, it did suck at the beginning. <laughs> it is an interesting thing of taking a gig like we were just talking about me opening for Metallica doing comedy. You're taking it knowing you're going to go in and just get fucking abuse. And you have to really sit down and think about what type of person that takes to be able to go, look, if we get a couple hundred people a night, uh, you know, that, that join, join in and dig us, would just keep grinding and keep finding it. And eventually you figure out how to do this, but it's interesting. The first few nights you're out there, you're just going like, man, wh what are we doing? And the weak do not survive. They, you know, the bands break up. They don't, they don't end up keep going. They have a couple opening tours and they're out. So that's a wild thing, right? It's like earning your stripes. Yeah. I think, and I think humans love narratives. We all know that. I mean, look at the world we live in right now and, you know, if you see an artist in their environment and you're having a good time and there's no expectations, it's a lot different than walking into a half empty stadium while everyone wants to see Metallica or GNR. Half the people have their arms crossed. It's scattered. The sound's not great. It's just kind of this thing. And, and so as an artist, you kind of have to like, there's two things you have to either. I think it's really healthy when you're younger to go through those things. But then at some point you need to question is it worth going out here and having these people see us in this environment or maybe they find you a couple of years later in your own environment that's a better environment um because mm -hmm. people will get this narrative in their head of like oh they suck because x y and z which were you know things outside of your control right like no one wants to be in 110 degree weather in georgia watching as the sun's going down some band that's annoying them because they want to see metallica mm -hmm. you know and and so like we had to like a lot of times we won't open anymore because we just know it's just a it's a weird um we would rather wait till people can see us in our environment at this point but in the beginning we needed to earn our stripes we needed to right. go out there we needed to get the bologna sandwiches thrown at us <laughs> we needed to have the iron maiden chant happening in between every one of our songs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and everyone letting us know that we sucked, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, but I don't know if I'd do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. You know, because at some point at first you're hungry yeah. and you're like, yeah, holy shit. We're going out with maiden. We're going out with Gina. I can't believe this, you know? And then after a while you're like, all right, we did that and we need to start saying no to stuff. And once you start mm -hmm. saying no, instead of uh, quantity, it's all about quality. That's how I look at it now as uh, doing gigs. You know, it's like, okay, I did that. And I also did it maybe for a chapter in a future book, opening for Metallica, Alice in Chains, or, you know, Marcus King. There's the chapter. But after that, you're like, <laughs> not the story. I don't need to keep going out and taking abuse because- as strong as you can be, it will fucking take you down, you know?
Yeah. And you, and I think the biggest part is just knowing that people aren't seeing the right representation of you. Yeah. Right. We, when we did the last Metallica stadium tour, you know, I, I famously was quoted in all the, um, you know, the tabloid things, um, trying to get us to look like we were talking shit on them. We weren't, but we turned that tour down at first because I was like, you know, we've co we're coming off the back of two number one records. We have this crazy stage production. We've got a third record coming out. And I wanted people, I know we could do arenas on our own, so let's let them see that. But then it was like, okay, well, Metallica is doing stadiums, which is, you know, 5X the arenas. And it was like, okay, let's let's give this a shot. But getting out there, it was like, dude, I don't think this is right for us right now. This is, people are hearing our name and then they're seeing this version of us when I wish they'd just come into the arena and see the the blown out big stage show, the, the vision. And so I think, yeah, like, at a certain point, you have to kind of put that to bed and go, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this and we're standing on our own. But watching those guys, how they controlled an audience, watching how they acted, how professional all those bands were, were things that we needed to see in person mm -hmm. to really understand how to act ourselves when we got to that point or when we were doing our own thing. So again, it's exactly what you said. It's at some point, and then saying no is, is powerful. And when you're saying no and you truly mean no, that's even more powerful when it's not just a, you know, like a, a bargaining tool when it's really like, no, we're just not doing that. Then it gets, you start seeing those crazy offers. And then if you can still say no to that, then you're in a good position. Yeah. yeah I think, I think real quickly on that, but just to piggyback off Matt, what Matt said though, too, when we did say no at first to Metallica, like you said, the stage had just come out. We were we were about to go do this whole thing with our new production, with our new album. We were really excited about it. We spent so much time on like we always do. We're fucking proud of this record. We wanted to go represent it the way that we wanted to. And then, of course, as Matt said, they they misconstrued his his comments as like we said no to Metallica. It's like we're friends with these guys. We were already friends. Yeah. We've already been out with them before. Like this was not a it wasn't a, a pissing contest of any kind. It was literally like we were trying to think about what was best for our career. And, but at the end of the day, we ended up doing it and it was, it was fucking for what it was. It was good. We still wish that we had a little bit more time with the stage. Turns out we didn't have as much time with that cycle. So it is what it is now. Well, it is a sad state of affairs now where the interviews are all about clickbait. You know, uh, they're never going to talk about a great, great interview. I've had, guys on this show and I've talked to them for two, three hours and just incredible conversations about life, art, music, anything. And then boom, one little thing. He said such and such. And it's like, that, that's not what he said. He just fucking, <laughs> you know, and then it's like, oh, well, the interview got like 800,000 listens, but all for the wrong reason. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like wild. Yeah, I, yeah I think, yeah. I mean, during that Metallica stuff, I remember, um, you know, Lars was calling me on the phone. We were trying to work it out and we had said no. And, and but the, the headline made it look like we're just totally dissing these guys. Right. And it's just like, you listen to the whole thing. It's like, these guys are our friends. You know, when we go up to Northern California, we hang out, we go to the bar or we're at their house or whatever. And to make it look like that is just so embarrassing. Cause it's like, come on. Like, I don't, I know they're going to wake up and read that. And then they're going to have to figure, you know, it's like, it just, but, but listen, that's, that's the world we live in right now, but mm -hmm. you kind of reap what you sow, right? Like we have art and um, music and all these things are so commoditized now. And it's because everyone's just got this quick, quick um, sort of reaction to things. And, you know, for something like any one of these tabloid magazines or metal magazines, it's better for them to get like, you know, 80,000 views and a bunch of likes on some, clickbait than it is for someone to sit there and read an, a, an article and have a discussion about it. And it's just not, there's no place for that anymore. It's they don't it's take Twitter. the time. Yeah. That's Twitter. It's a couple of things. And that's fine. Everyone knows that's what it is. And so as an artist, you kind of just have to embrace it and let those people be on their fringe and on their little, like whatever, like, honestly, at this point, I don't care how bad you are. Anyone talking about you at this day and age is good. It's just a yeah. weird thing. It's, and it's, it's a, it's a reflection of our society. Honestly, it's not a reflection on the people. It's a reflection on society. Um, so, and, and, you know, with our new record right now, like all you, all you see are 10 out of 10 reviews and zero out of 10 reviews. Right. I love that. And it's like, but it's like the best way to be because the people that hate it absolutely hate it. And they are just on, but you know, 
it's one of those things where in 2023, having a zero out of 10 is actually better than anything you could ask for because people are talking and it's a weird society we live in at this point. Well, Mitzi Shore, the famous owner of the uh, Polly Shore's mom, owner of mm -hmm. the comedy store, she said it best. She's like, you need half the people to hate you and half to love you. And you will have an incredible career because they'll yeah. always be talking. If everybody likes you, it's you're doing something like wrong. <laughs> now, yeah, absolutely. Interesting thing to get into, because I will be honest with you. I was never an event sevenfold fan and I couldn't figure out why. Because I would listen, you know, I know that you love GNR. I'm a huge GNR guy. And I, I know you guys love all the right stuff. And each record, I would, you know, I'm not a guy that's like, I, I don't like them. I'm never rigid. I'm not a tumbleweed. I, I go, let's, let's give it a spin again. So this record, I've got to tell you, could be the best record I've heard in a couple of years. And it may be the record of the year for me. It's pretty early in, but uh, this Queens of the Stone Age new record, Rival Sons and the new King Gizzard are just all mind boggling to me. But this record is so fucking good. And it grabbed me. Nobody. I heard it and I was like, oh, what the fuck is this? Love the video. I love stop motion. I put on the record and I haven't stopped listening to it, man. And I am hooked. And what's funny was I talked about it last week on the podcast was I know a lot of fans hated it and, uh, or, you know, that's what I'm reading the clickbait. And I'm thinking if they weed out some people, maybe from growing and becoming a different type of band, that's all right. And now you've got other fans like me now. You know, like different people that are coming into the fold, like, wow, what is this? This is cool. And this record blows my mind, man. I appreciate it. I, I think you're exactly right. Listen, all artists can do is be a reflection of themselves at any point in time. And, yep. you know, there's nothing worse than when people are trying to put you in a box and want you to write the same music you wrote when we were in high school or 20 years old. And those were reflections of who we were back then. We were aggressive youth young kids that were just kind of all over the place like making um a certain type of music and every record kind of changed but this one in particular much more musical in terms of not having to have one foot fully in metal it's got so many different eclectic influences that we've had our whole life that we never really were able to um kind of quantify like if you think about like the residents or mr bungle or um, all these different things that we were growing up listening to. And I think this is just where we're at right now. And yeah, you can't worry about, um, it's a different type of record. Like you said, like the philosophy, all of it is different. And so it's not going to appeal to people that want the same thing or more of the same, or, or they're there in their life right now. It doesn't mean they're not going to get here. Maybe they're just not here right now. You know, maybe it's our job to put our arm around them and say, Hey, you know, we're up the street at this bar and let's hang out here. Like this is the, what we're doing now. Um, there's so many psychological things that go into if people like records or not, or if they don't or what they're listening to at the time. And it's not really our job to figure that out. It's just our job to put something out that we totally back and we appreciate. Um, and we'll see where it goes. You know, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to really talk about it because it's hard to, you know, there's really no right or wrong answer. It's, uh, it's okay to hate this record. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, man, I can't even believe it, actually. I don't even know how you write a record like this. It's funny to think about nobody as a single. No way is this a traditional <laughs> single. But when you really listen to it, the hooks are, there's so many hooks in this single. You know, starting with the, you know, the, how it comes on, that's stuck in your head. And then how the verses flow. And, and I hear so much influence on this. I hear some Alan Parsons. I hear some Daft Punk. I hear some Alice in Chains. I hear some Zappa. It is insane, some systems, but it's all blended into something that's very original. And, and, it, it, and the balls to make a record like this and be like, yeah, fuck you, man. This is something that has depth and it's going to take you a while to take it all in. Don't just spin it and go, eh, I don't like it because man, I was spinning it over and over. And I was being like, wow. Like when I got to ordinary, I was like, 
this is insane. I, I can't, I'm looking at my buddy. We're riding around. The cutie the song. He loved the cutie song. <laughs> I was just Turn it like, down. Yeah. this is fucking great, man. I mean, and that was calling people. I'm like, holy shit. Have you heard this new sevenfold record? And they're like, is this Dean? You know, I'm like, I'm yeah, just yeah. telling you, man, this thing is fucking great. I'm telling everyone like old school. It's, it's a lot like when Metallica put out Injustice for All. And people are like, what the fuck is that? I mean, that thing was so different from Master of Puppets. It, you know, it has no bass. The songs are long and weird and proggy. I love bands that make something totally outside the box, man. And that's what you guys did. Yeah, there's a few records I think of that for my era and my age when they came out. One is Pinkerton by Weezer. It was like, yeah. you know, they blew up with the Blue Album. And then... They put out Pinkerton, which is one of my favorite records of all time. It's just dirty. It's so good. It's lyrically uncomfortable. It's um, all these things. And that's one. And then Disco Volante is one from Mr. Bungle. Mr. Bungle was already weird with the self-titled, but Disco Volante was just like Mike Patton's not even singing. He's just yeah. making noises <laughs> the whole time. And there's just, <laughs> it's like them messing around with keyboards. Like it's, it blows my mind. But those are records that like, Yeezus is one for me with Kanye. Like he put out a pretty much a heavy metal record that everyone in hip hop hated it. And now it's one of his essential like records, but there's always those things that kind of stand outside the box and outside the norm and they ruffle feathers and people have knee jerk reactions. And I think this is definitely one of those, you know, and, um, but you got to make sure that it's backed up with musicality. There's, it's got to be backed up with like some depth, right? It can't just be weird for weird sake. And I think right. that's a lot of people's um, I've seen, um, a lot of people's like go to on this of I hate it because they're just trying to be weird. It's like no, actually, we're not. It's just and they're this like, is what we're into. Be, yeah, <laughs> they're trying to be prog. It's like prog is the last thing on our minds. We don't care about that. All we care yeah. about is writing shit that feels cool <laughs> and, and it sounds and good to people, us and it's what we want to yeah. make. That's the whole. Yeah, people overthink it and they and they put stuff. They try to even put these things in boxes and I think progs even become its own box which mm -hmm. sucks because prog should be, it should be so many different directions. It should be, you know, you, why does prog have rules that, you know? Yeah. So I think it's, it's such a, like, a, um, the world is funny. People like to put things in a, you know, a box so they can kind of, um, you know, discuss it better, I guess. But this record is kind of boxless, I guess. Let me ask you guys how you went about writing this record because there is a thing where, look, a fan can say they're just doing this to try to be weird. Look, people can sit down and try to be weird and it wouldn't work. There wouldn't be songs there. They wouldn't know how to be. You can't be authentically weird if you're just trying to be, you know what I'm saying? You can't just, yeah. you can't be fake weird is what I mean. You know, like, hey, yeah. we're going to be weird on this record. There's no way, because when I'm listening to the songwriting and just the 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 parts in the song, I'm like, how the fuck did they come up with that? And 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 it all flows. How did you guys sit down and start to write this record? It's not like you get a couple of acoustics and you're like, all right, I got this tune, you know? I mean, how did this come about? I think one thing that we, I think most of our favorite musicians or, or writers, whether it's movies or um art or music i think one thing that i've kind of like noticed is that they have interesting minds and they and they have and they're very creative um in terms of like um just their taste and the things that they that like if something hits me and i'm listening to it on the radio like i'll make a note of it and i'm like oh that was that made me like feel weird or i got chills like on that part or i i was thrown off i was confused there and i'll make a note of it right and kind of go back later and see why that made me feel that way. And the same happens for movies. Um, the same happens for when I see a piece of art and I'll make little notes. And on this record, we kind of wanted to really um, only keep portions of songs in the record that were noteworthy. So for instance, we were, if you listen to like, We Love You, that beginning where it's all kind of out of time and then it jumps into that like techno rave sort of more this more that yeah. you know that that was like a mistake on the click track the click got moved over to something and it moved into something else and i'm i'm hearing and i was like what the 
like that messed me up and it was it was all in the same grid but it messed me up and so i was like well what if we write a riff and then one's on one side and one and so like things like that that made me jolt or my heart kind of skipped a beat we just basically said we're only keeping stuff that does that right or <laughs> only stuff that really makes you feel something emotional or makes you turn and look at the speaker or go what happened there and so i think it was taking a lot of time to make sure that we had those elements, those moments, um, walking around on mushrooms or watching movies and, and, and taking note from like maybe an Ari Aster film or something that's like, Oh, that midsummer makes me feel this way. Well, what is, what does it feel like to be in the middle of the daylight? Um, you know, in a horror film, you know, things like that, that kind of twist your like perception of what they should be and then writing music around it. So there's no real answer because it comes from so many different places, but yeah, just kind of waiting it out and not just sitting there and staring at each other, plugged in going, <laughs> hey, what do you yeah. got? You know, like- it, yeah, we've, done, just, we've done that enough. We wanted, we, we wanted to get out of that. Sure. We yeah, wanted yeah. to get out so, of that world. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was, that, that, that's always a bore. So we wanted to get away from that. So it was more like, hey, I saw this film. I felt this way about it. And, and you know, this is, this is this kind of the, the dialogue that's happening and you know like something like we love you the beginning here you are you've come so far sunny days we're thinking of like sesame street growing up <laughs> this morbid sort of like big bird running around and like hey it's all great <laughs> come on guys like so we're trying to like channel that right with the with the grind of everyday life so to us that shift into the 808 te techno sort of euro rave part was more like the grind of life but contrasted with sesame street Right. And mm -hmm. like the yeah. sun shining and everything's great. And like, so just those kind of ideas pop in your head and you just go all in on it instead of trying to hide it, just step into it for what it is. Right. And make other people feel that sort of crazy shift. Were there any tracks that didn't make it because they just didn't feel like the flow of the record, you know, because this record is really abstract. So if you had just kind of a normal rock tune, it'd be like, mm, that's not really going to make it in there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, several of stuff. A lot, a lot of, a lot of re uh, things coming in and out. I mean, we also had uh, originally that idea to do a bunch of uh, what do you call them? Uh, buffers in between, not buffers. Why am I uh, bumpers in between each song and have them like kind of flow into each other and stuff? And it just was kind of taken away from the vibe a lot. I think so, right? Yeah, and I think um, what I always try to say this because I hope it inspires other people that are creative, whether they like our band or not. But ninety nine percent of the stuff doesn't get used, right? It's mm -hmm. like we, on all of our records. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we write and we write and we write and we have, you know, when you pick up a guitar, um, the nobody riff, as simple as it is with that tone, yeah, that's a one in every 500 times you pick up a guitar, right? Because most of the time you pick it up and it's like, bump, 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 da, 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 and it's like the normal, you go to the modes and you're playing some blues and you're playing... But one in 500 times you sit down and it's and you've got this like vision. You're like, okay, well, that's ominous. But what if I, what if I play with melodic or I'm sorry, minor and major, and I go back and forth and, and build this thing. Mm. That's one in 500, but the 499 things you came up before that, they sit on a hard drive somewhere and you're probably not going to touch them. Um, and so to me, that's like, that should be in, inspirational to people. Cause I think a lot of people, they start trying stuff and they go, Oh, I don't have it. I don't have it in me because I have all these things that aren't great. Well, so do we, we 99% of the stuff we make is not great or, or even worthwhile being on a record. It's just kind of, it's trash. Right. And <laughs> just kind of move on from it. Well, I think that's another part of this record too. I, I know you, you talked a little bit before Matt on that, that ear, ear catching stuff that we were hearing. We always had those elements in our records before where we'd be writing together and laughing our asses off or doing whatever, because something was happening like one time per song. But I think the focus, uh, like Matt was saying, of making sure it happens multiple times on the song in the entire album and trimming out all the fat along the way is really a uh, part of what brought this album together too. It's, it, it's just blows my mind, man, because Something like a uh, uh, that is like it's pretty basic, but when you add everything around it, the colors, how the vocal comes in, and then and then just Brooks drumming and stuff, you're like, oh wow! All of a sudden, it becomes 
this whole piece and it starts to unwind and you're going like, this is, this is just incredible. This song, you know? And, and then every time I hear that, that intro now, it's just like, ah, oh, yeah. You know, I know what's coming. It's funny. PTSD kicks in. <laughs> oh, no. Here it is. The lawnmower, as people have said. Um, they call it the lawnmower. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah, yeah, I the think, lawnmower. Yeah, you know what yeah. it reminds me of? Um, if just for a second of Eddie Van Halen on, uh, like, I think it's running with the, you know, the, the horn at the beginning. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, dun, yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Da, 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 da. I heard that. I can that, hear that one. That was a car horn, you know. I never knew that as a kid, but uh, it's that kind of vibe of things that just stick in your head. This record has a bunch of that, though. You know, when you get into, like I said, ordinary or easier, there's like there's so much depth and and different stuff going on. It's like a full sound landscape, man. Yeah, I think you know one thing that really helped push this record over the edge was the uh the lyrical kind of themes right like not only the mundaneness of life but like the absurdity of it and um and when you look at your life in like all these kind of like pieces there's all these memories that stick out and they're usually like it's usually like a um collection book or like you know memories that pop in and out or all these like really either interesting parts of your life or sitting in your bed when you're six just chilling like there's all these you know we have this like scatterbrain um sort of memory of the past and 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 how life you know i don't know how old you are but i'm 41 and you know it's like if i blink i don't even know how i got here right it all just it, the way time works and the way we perceive time and obviously there's entropy and things have happened and time is real but at the same time it feels like a dream it feels right. insane right and i and i imagine the same if i make it to 80 uh, the same thing is going to happen. I'm going to feel like nothing had passed and it just, I'm there in the present. And so to really step into that and make the record have these left turns, have these moments that are super catchy, but we never overdo them. Not trying to like milk any sort of theme. The the overall theme is the sporadicness and the randomness of it, the absurdity of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, that sort of theme lyrically helped us to, make more sense of the randomness of the actual music and the tracks and, you know, not staying anywhere for too long. Um, because as life is, you're just, you're here now and you were somewhere else then. And it's vastly different things, but kind of the same. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to kind of try to quantify it or to, you know, put that on in audio form. Um, but that's the kind of our best attempt at it. I think I think that this record is in a level of what Axel thought he could get to with Chinese democracy, and he never really got there as far as being a totally different type of band from the appetite and then going into the illusion records. You're you're slowly losing people like, what is this illusion stuff? You know what? And I think those are hmm. incredible records. Right records. Oh, I love well, one and two are my favorites. They're like. fucking, they're, they're insane. But Chinese democracy, it just didn't get there. And I think you guys definitely got there as far as like a totally different style record. I wanted to ask you at what point, because I would listen to Appetite and then I would listen to Mr. Bungle and then I would listen to NWA. At what point uh, when you were younger, did you start reaching out, both of you guys, and listening to different types of music? Because there are those people that are like, no way, metal only. And it's like, really? Mm. You're, you're not going to listen to Johnny Cash? You're, you're not going to listen to Miles Davis or or Peter Tosh or something? No fucking way. At what yeah. point were you uh, digging into stuff? Was it like your parents or did you just find it from other cool friends? I think a little bit of both for me. Um, honestly, I was growing up. My father was more of the metalhead rock rock guy. My mom was listening to pop music. She was an aerobics teacher. She had mixtapes all the time around when she was listening to Michael Jackson or anything else in the, that was popular in the 80s. So I grew up with a lot of that, and I loved that stuff too. Um, but I think it wasn't until I was about 10 or 11 when I started to kind of venture out myself, not just because my parents had showed me different music, where I started discovering uh, bands like Primus or Mr. Bungle or something like that, or a lot of punk rock. That's when punk rock was was uh, was in my life, was right around then. I was discovering No Effects, Pennywise, and Rancid. Um, 
And that was all right around, you know, fifth grade of elementary school. And from then on, it was just, I, w- I always just loved music. I, maybe it was because I had an eclectic house with different uh, vibes. I mean, my grandmother introduced me to, uh, uh, you know, all the country stars. She was a big Dolly Parton fan. Um, so I, I think just like early on, I've always had this, I was always exposed to it. And then at about 10, 11 years old is when I really started to go to the warehouse uh, down the street and buy stuff for myself. And that's when I started like, you'd pick out CDs or tape cassettes at the time for me uh, based on the cover. A lot of times, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, I would be like, well, I know this band kind of, but I, I don't know. I, I got to look at the album cover to see which one of, of them I'm going to give a listen to, you know, and you end up finding weird shit that way. I think there's a lot of guar. Some of my favorite guar records I found that way, you know, it's like, it's, it, it was really fun. I, I think it's kind of, I hope that they can still, I mean, Kids seem to still be able to do it these days. I mean, everything's on streaming. You can just kind of, I don't know if they're going through the libraries as much though, or is it all word of mouth at this point? I, I, I just don't know. Yeah. Well, the difference now is that people don't have to live with a record. When we had to buy a record for seventeen ninety nine, oh, true. if you didn't like it, you had to live with it. And then you ended up liking it. Yeah. Um, yeah I remember so, one, I, one of my biggest things with that, I remember everyone at school told me, "New De- or there's a band called Death by Stereo. It's incredible. Oh, wow. I went to Bionic Records bought it. I could not stand it. I could not stand <laughs> Ephraim's voice, but I bought the record. So then I started listening to it. It became one of my favorite records of all time, which is that first Death by Stereo record. But if I lived in, you know, if I was born in 2015, I would have just been next, next, next yeah. trash. Right. This is garbage. Yeah. yeah all, all the internet for sure. Just let everyone know what you think about it. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so real quick for me, it was, my dad was listening to, um, the very earliest stuff I had, my dad was listening to all the stuff from Beatles to Alice Cooper, one of his favorite artists of all time, Led Zeppelin, all that had vinyl. Then he, but he was very modern in, in terms of he saw Guns N' Roses on Headbangers Ball. So he got, you know, um, Super Unknown, Soundgarden, um, Nirvana, Nevermind, GNR, Skid Row. He was listening to all that stuff. Then I met Jimmy Sullivan, the Rev. Um, and I when I went to his house, I noticed he had 500 million tapes you know, they're all on on his room. So that got me into like everything from Slayer to Testament to No Effects to Bad Religion, everything on Epitaph, everything Fat Records. But he was also listening to like the Sparks, the Residents, Mr. Bungle, yeah, um, Frank Zappa. So that was a crazy thing. And then when I met Brian, Brian was like learning. He, he wanted to be a studio musician. And this is like around sixth grade um, or fifth grade. And huh. Brian would go into the studio with his dad and he was learning, you know, jazz and um, all these different things. And we showed him Pantera, which blew his mind. He heard Dimebag okay. Daryl for the first time. So we made him a metalhead. He opened our eyes to like Steely Dan and things like that. And then Mr. Bungle was like kind of the, the thing that we all loved and we all loved punk rock and we all loved that. So it was just like, a, Jimmy really was the guy that had everything very eclectic, but Brian brought in an outside thing that most kids our age weren't listening to. You know, we weren't listening to classical or jazz or these other things that he was learning all these modes on the guitar. Um, But we all shared a love for aggressive music and punk rock and even hardcore, you know, a lot of like vision of disorder, poison the well, um, sick of it all, gorilla biscuits, youth of today, you know, all those things. So just being in Southern California, I think, and having a group of friends yeah. that were just into music, um, we just were taking it all in, and we were trying to fit into everything. We were going to heavy metal shows, we were going to punk rock shows, we were going to Warp Tour, we were going to Ozfest, we we're going to Metallica and Candlebox, we we're going to Judas Priest, we we're going to Pantera and and Ozzy or Black Sabbath. I mean, we we're just doing everything. It was just, I think it, and I think it comes down to where where we live, right? Southern right. California kind of had everything, and a good group of people. Dude, Orange County specifically too. I heard Dean talking about social D on his last episode. Oh, social, I have like, a social distortion tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it's like, it's Orange yeah. County to the max, like where we grew up and the it's right time, right place. Right. I mean, the late nineties, I mean, you had everything you had, you had no doubt blowing up out of Orange County all over everywhere with, with tragic kingdom while you still got, you know, all the other, all the other punk bands and social D's of the world that were still big, but not like on that, mainstream I'll, I'll say you know it was like just underneath yeah. that and, and we had bionic records yeah which i'd go to bionic and this guy mike who now owns it mike would show me like at the gates or you know blind guardian or sonata Arctic, like european right. power metal and children of bodom and 
stuff before, like these are like our first records, right? First, second records. And so taking that, mixing it with like Pantera and, and Bad Religion and NoFX, having, having a curator like Mike in my life where I'd go to Bionic every day. And if I was buying the new Corn record, he's like, oh, check out At The Gates too. Or, you know, I'm buying the new Pantera and he's like, oh, check out, you know, Chill the Boat, I'm a hate breeder. You'll probably love that record. Having a guy like that helped a lot because it, it opened my eyes to what was happening in Europe. Yeah. And I think, you know, record shops, um, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it's not the same just seeing it on a playlist on Spotify. It's just, yeah. cause you don't have anyone vouching for it, right? You don't have anyone like kind of curating and saying, this is the good stuff. No, instead you got everyone's giving all their hate about it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. And and it is cool to have somebody like at a record store when you're in there and, you know, I go in, I go, man, I love this 16 horsepower, this band from Colorado. The guy goes, oh, if you like that, you're going to like where they got it from Gun Club. Check that out. And they're like, huh? And you're going backwards. You're finding shit backwards, yes. you know, which is, and, and it's always from learning at the record store. I spent hours in a record store and, and you know, and that, that whole thing of the dude just going like, nah, that sucks. You and your kiss here, fucking listen to this. And they yeah. give you something and you're like, what is this? You know, yeah. and whatever yeah. it is, you know, cause you start yeah. out with whatever you like and that's all you like for a little while. And then somebody, I always said that they should induct the older brother into the rock and roll hall of fame. Totally. <laughs> I don't have one, but you know, everybody has that guy, the neighbor, the older brother or whatever. That's like, dude, put this on and learn it. You know, I had, I had two older brothers that did that to me. So <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's Mike for me at bionic. That's yeah. I'd walk in there. I was the young kid and he was, you know, that sucks. This is what you want to listen to, you know, like you know, <laughs> anything mainstream just sucked. <laughs> just so just... good. I love that. Speaking of, uh, we're, uh, John is just talking about artwork and looking at album covers, the album cover of this, uh, new record. I love Ralph Steadman, you know, and it has yeah. that kind of vibe. And I just love the artwork of the album cover too. Hey, can you tell I like this record? <laughs> like, oh, I already know like the, the sevenfold fans are going to be like, dude, enough, go back and listen to Hail to the King or fucking, you know, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> but the album cover looks fantastic. Who did that? And what was the idea of it? Yeah. So Wes Lang did it. Wes Lang um, is, you know, described by GQ as the world's most badass artist. Wow. So he's uh, this guy that uh, he's a friend of ours now, but it took like six years to get to really know him. Um, I fell in love with his stuff when I saw it. I saw it on a bunch of different things, but he ended up doing the Yeezus album with all that heavy metal artwork. Um, he did some stuff with Amiri. Um, he did some stuff for Grateful Dead, but he doesn't really do much. You gotta, gotta, gotta know him. And he he just, I was sending him demos. He was showing me art. It was both inspiring each other. And then one day he did 20 pieces of art and said, I did this for the record. You know, and I had asked him for years to do something and it was always no. Um, and then it was just kind of amazing. Like it was just the right time in his life, the right time in our life. And he just sketched out these things and it was just, you know, I interpret it as this, the, the anxiety of life and the reapers always waiting. And he's, he kind of interprets it as it's my job to tap you on the shoulder and say, you are going to die. So act, act accordingly, right. Uh, yeah, live in the moment. Moving. Uh, yeah. Should... Get moving. Yeah. Do, do what you want to do. Yeah. And so I think it was a perfect blend of, um, working with him on this. I don't think the record, the aesthetic would be anywhere where it is now without him. Um, I always attribute a lot of this to him because, and I always am texting him and calling him and just like, this wouldn't be the same without him because everything from the merchandise to the live show to when you open up that packaging or in the vinyl, the, the deluxe version, all 20 pieces of art, it's really stunning. And Wes is just, you know, he's one of those guys where if you can get him to do something, it's awesome. But probably going to be no. So, which makes it even sweeter, right? It's like, right. it's awesome that he did it. Um, yeah. Wes Lang. Let's talk a little bit about the record comes out and you got to get ready to tour and you got to learn to play this fucking record and to sing this record. I mean, this isn't, I, I'm so bummed. I missed you guys. I had no idea that you played a couple weeks ago at what was it? The forum or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm furious because I would have loved to seen this, man. I should have texted you, man. I'm sorry. I oh, should have let you know. I was like, God <laughs> damn. Here I am watching it on Blabbermouth. I'm like, what the fuck? 
(laughs) But once you started to, you know, you write the record, you record it and everything. And then you go, oh, my God, now we got to go out and do these songs live. How did that come about? Did you did you have to drop some stuff or did you just figure it out? Do you have to use some tapes? What's going on with that? Well, it's a little. Go ahead, man. You want to go? No, you go ahead. So we I think we we do a really um, we have an interesting blend of technology and organic, right? Um, mm-hmm. So on the record, you know, we don't use much technology. Um, we, we, you know, we're using old technology like vocoders and real, not using plugins. We're using a lot of real stuff, whether it's tape or phasers or all things that are kind of outboard gear. Um, but, you know, the songs are on a click track, right? We're playing to some sort of click, even if we can, even if it's not on a click, we can create a click around the things that move, right? So for instance, in Mattel, there's that, and I know it might sound crazy, but I, that was all done, not on a click, but right. you could sit there and hear where the, you know, the Mellotron and the and the sort of different things are playing and you can create a click to it. So live, we're playing to a click and we're using this really cool blend of technology where because it's on a click, we can have all the guitar tones and the flute and the strings and all these things, we can actually have it all modulate and turn into what we want it to turn into at a particular time in a song. So what that means is it took a ton of time to program it all. (laughs) But like if there's a flute or like some strings or there's a guitar tone that switches, the guys just have to play and it will switch through their rigs. It's automated. Um, Yeah. So something like, um, and we haven't seen anyone do it yet, but Brian really is kind of insane on this stuff, like learning where it's going. So like, for instance, in the middle of game over, it's like thrash, thrash, thrash. And then that bridge hits they're actually playing all those notes on the guitar, but it turns into like a flute and like a Mellotron, but they're oh, like playing through their guitar. Any type of shit? Yeah, it's all it's, MIDI. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so all MIDI. It is MIDI. Like a, like it'll flip through like, um, it'll turn into a fractal. And then as soon as it gets to the next part, it will flip back out and back into the amp. Wow. Um, so, and then so like in something like, um, you know, something like Mattel, there's this crazy solo that people aren't sure if it's a synth or if it's a guitar. It's like all that weird stuff that he's doing. He's basically got that. So it clicks into a synth with a harmonizer thrown auto tune on it. So it hits those notes real sharp and he's controlling it with his foot on a pedal. pedal. But during that portion, it flips over to that and it goes into that. And then as soon as the next part hits, it flips out. So We've basically gone down every song and programmed everything to to do what we need it to do so we can play it all live. We haven't seen that done yet. It's it's a challenge, but it's kind of off. even my vocal effects when I sing like a there's a phaser on it, I just have to sing and it happens. It just pops on. Oh, and then it yeah. pops back out or like on ordinary hard autotune hits, then a vocoder hits and then it's out. And so it's 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 really fun because you can kind of just be free and and sing and it just all happens. It's almost yeah, like it affects a built in. You know, it's yeah. like a play. You're up there fucking delivering this big grandioso record, you know? How much yeah. of the record are you doing live? We're doing all of it except three songs right now. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, we're doing like Game Over, Mattel, We Love You, Nobody, and then G O D and Life is But a Dream. So and we'll add Cosmic in later because people are really liking Cosmic. Um, but at that point, there'll only be two songs that we haven't played, which is, you know, it's a lot for a new record. But again, we are pushing into this new era and we're not, we're not going to be shy of it. I right. love I love that, man. It's like, nah, man, this is it. You know, yeah. either you get on board or you're left behind, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, and, and the way, real quick, the way I'd put it is, you know, the way, the way uh, uh, Joel Madden explained it to me, he said, you're just going to the bar up the street, put your arm around these people and say, come on up here and check this out. And, you know, you don't want to like, you don't want to demean people and tell them they're stupid for not getting it or, yeah. and, and sometimes we want to, you know, sometimes you want to like, Oh, you know, like people will write it off because of the production or something they don't, you know, they're not used to, or yeah, they're just being weird to be weird or, or they don't, they forgot how to write a song and you just want to go, you idiot, but you don't, you go, no, yeah. no, live with it for a little bit and come on up the street. And so, I hope that people do that. I, I know people will. People are, pe- people come around to things. We all have. I hated the wall at first. I hated oh. the wall for 10 years. And then one day I was sitting in Lake Powell and I put it on and I'm looking at the stars and I was like, 
what was I thinking? How did yeah, I not yeah. get this? You know, like and that's that's just life. You know, it's being a human. It's like kiss the elder. You know. Yeah. When that mm-hmm. came out, I bought it, and I was like, oh. What happened? What happened? Yeah. I think I'm like, you know, 13 or 12. And now I put it on and go, these guys were fucking ballsy to do this. And I love, <laughs> I love like half the record. I'm like, this shit is cool, man. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like with Matt, Metallica, they all want Metallica to be kill them all. And they all want Metallica with Cliff Burton. They all want Metallica with the long hair. They all want Metallica to be strictly speed metal, you know, and every time they drop a record, here comes the fucking trolls, you know, it's, hard <laughs> to feel. I love it. Meanwhile, the stadiums are full, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think one, I've always had a lot of pride in Metallica because they do change it up. You know, I've mm-hmm. always felt that, that was awesome. I just, but that's just my personality. Some people say, Matt, you're an idiot. Like, we yeah. we we listen to this band because we like this thing. We don't we don't care about their artistic exploration. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But I but I do. I, I think it's when I look when I like a band, I like like I said earlier, I like their taste. I like where they're taking me because you know, just like and I've used this analogy before, but like even with an iPhone, you know, like at one point we were all mad because the button was gone on the bottom. And now I can't even believe we used to have a button <laughs> on the bottom. Things evolve and they and they get used to it. And it's and it's nice to see where someone's someone's creativity will take you because without that you know we'd all be just rehashing the same things and that's not fun and well, they complain the about that people, they complain about that too they complain well, about well, that the movies well, too well, like, why are they all, redoing all these remakes well and a lot of times what <laughs> happens what is people for. a lot of times what happens is people don't say anything and they just move on to something else yeah mm. because something else will pique their interest and it'll become exciting and 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 why not have your favorite band do that instead of waiting for something else to come along and knock your favorite band off the pedestal because they're stuck redoing the same thing when they could have probably yeah. done something different and taken you there. It's not always going to land. And that's yeah. just the part of, that's just that's just art. And it might not even land for you now. It might land for you in 10 years or next month, or maybe it never does, but you might respect it. Who knows? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the years of you singing. This, the singing on this record is pretty insane. And uh, I know over the years you've had some problems. Uh, I came close to having nodes. I got lucky, caught it quick, and just relearned to sing. And uh, with proper, you know, warming up and sleep and no talking after the gigs. But what has changed over the years? I know at the beginning you were like a screamer. Then you had some problems. You had some surgery. Uh, you saw Ron Anderson. Everybody goes to see him, I guess, at one point in their career, looking for the uh, magic uh, answers. But what what changed for you? And is it tough to sing like something like this live, you know, because it's so many different flavors? Yeah, this record's actually way easier for me to sing than the old stuff, because the old stuff always is sitting in that that mixed bridge. And it's always at like 10 right? It's always like F sharp, G, A, B, B flat, or B flat, B, um, and maybe up to C, D, and you're constantly in there, and you're just doom, 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 like nonstop, and the attrition on your voice, eventually, you'll have one show where you go wide on a vowel, or something kind of gets out of place, and then you're like, oh, shit, I got 36 more dates to do, and I've got not much time to recover, so eventually, things start going south, right, and Things went really south for me in 2018 um, after the Metallica tour. It was actually after a European tour. I knew I was in trouble, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to cancel Download Festival. I didn't want to cancel Hellfest and all these things. I should have probably, but I don't regret it because what had happened is Ron Anderson ended up passing away, unfortunately. Um, and I started working with Seth Riggs and Seth and his wife, Margareta, um, they turned my technique around. And, and even on the record, um, the record was difficult to get through, but even now being a year out from it, there, things are even way further progressed from even that. Right. And then it's, I, I, because I'm just in this new technique and learning it and going live is, you know, you walk out there and all the bad habits, like you oh, yeah. gotta keep them at bay, you know, like, so well, especially after five years of not being yeah, yeah, out there's there. Like, there's like the anxiety of it. And then there's like, Oh, I used to. So to give like the quick macro of this, Ron really taught me to sing from the head voice down 
Seth wants me to sing from chest up through a healthier bridge with more of an anchor on the voice. So I've been doing that. It's been really healthy. It's been awesome. I love it. Um, learning every single day, you know, before this, I had an hour vocal lesson with them. I do it every single day with them. Um, and part of it is just trying to not get yourself outside the walls to start chipping away at the, you know, the attrition on the voice and just trying to stay in that tunnel and keep it clear and keep it, you know, healthy. And then just doing it every night and hoping I don't fall outside of that and then get myself in trouble again. But, you know, that's kind of the, the curse of lead singers, you know, you're the yep. one that can't go to the party after you can't be out of control. You can't be raising your voice in a, a club setting. You can't <laughs> be out all night. You can't be drinking before the show or anything, you know, you're kind of just there and you're kind of just got to <laughs> try to get through two hours every night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what about the touring schedule now you guys are out on tour or was that like a one-off gig? Uh, what's going on with that forum gig? Cause I don't see you guys are home right now. We're home right now. We're, we're in between, we're, we're kind of ramping up. Cause like we, I just said, it's been five years um, between shows that we played since 2018 to uh, our first one back was actually uh, uh, at area 15 in Las Vegas, where we had a, uh, augmented reality uh, set up and everything like that. It was a really cool spot. And we wanted to try and do something because we were about to do Danny Wimmer's festivals in Daytona and Columbus in front of, you know, however many thousands of people that were. And we're like, we should probably try something a little bit smaller before we go do those after five years of not playing. So, you know, we did a, a fun little thing uh, in Vegas and we did those two festival dates. We did the Kia Forum two weeks ago. And this week we're going to be in New York doing Madison Square Garden. So it's been... Oh, what day is that? That will be the 23rd. What is that? A Sunday? This Friday. It's a Friday. This coming oh, Friday. I'm going to be in New York, but I'm not there till Sunday. I was like, oh, that'd be great to see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh man. And then we start... See, we have three weeks yeah. off and then we start another tour. Um, And then that'll be more of a proper tour. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, they're all... I'm so glad we did Vegas. Cause that was, I instantly went back to bad habits, you know, and it, but it was a short set. I was able to have a week off regroup, went into uh, Rockville. It was a good set, but not great. Regrouped, got it. And you know, just started getting it under control, you know, cause you have all these old songs that you're so used to this thing you were doing before. And now it's gotta be another way or you're just gonna get yourself in trouble. So, um, we luckily we, uh, had these shows before the big boy shows, you know? Yeah. Just, just little ways of getting us back into it after so long. And like, you know, it gives Matt uh, some time in between the shows and stuff like that, which is a blessing for right now. And now that, you know, he's feeling a lot better. We'll be in buses in July doing the, you know, the North American run. So that'll be, that'll be a, that'll be a whole other thing that we got to get ready for. <laughs> oh man. And, uh, Who's on the tour with you guys? It's you guys headline, and then you bring in out some bands. Yeah, we got yeah, Falling so Reverse. Falling Reverse on the second half, and this kid uh, named Kim Dracula. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, on the Canadian part, we're doing Alexis on Fire. Oh, mm -hmm. um, awesome. they're they're a big Canadian band, you know, and they do really well there. And um, Kim Dracula, we wanted to give someone like we we're trying to make the tour something that people haven't really seen before. It's one thing that's important to us is not bringing out the um the usual suspects and so um kim dracula is like kind of a uh i would say like a marilyn manson type character but for tiktok he's oh. huge on there and he's never toured and we wanted to bring someone else that's different and it's it's um controversial for sure the stuff he mm -hmm. does the music videos he does and it seemed really interesting to is he, is to he is, does he identify as he i'm sorry or is oh i don't know i probably I don't know. I never. I just. I, I just want to make sure. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Now you're making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it worked. I don't know. Success. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh oh, there. There's the blabber mouth. Quick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there is a person yeah. named Kim Dracula that's coming to tour with us. Yeah. Day. Johnny, Johnny, you said an interesting thing, and it does kind of blow me away of what's going on with the music biz these days. And I don't really understand it. And I loved how you guys went about it, just dropping one single, nobody. These bands are putting out like half the record before the record's out. And by the time the record comes out, I don't think there's any more heat for it. You're like, uh, you feel like in your mind, you got the gist of the record. 
I'm talking about for surface fans and they don't really go maybe dig the last half of it. Isn't that an interesting way to do it? It's, it's, it's bizarre. It's like the fifties where they just dropped singles. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that is the nature of everything being on playlists and everything like that. You want, I mean, every artist wants to be on a, on a Spotify playlist, right? So that, that single gets picked up and then hopefully they, they discover the record through that. Um, Honestly, right now, I think it's kind of a cool time um, because it is kind of the Wild West. You, if you're going to release an entire record of music, there's no real wrong way of doing it. And there's no right way. There's no wrong way. It's just kind of like, yeah, you can put out the four singles you do. Metallica did like four or five singles before 72 Seasons came out. Still a great record. Everyone's still stuck around for it. I still hear it on the radio all the time still. Um, and then there's something like we did where we just we started when we were mixing the Poconos, we made the decision that we only wanted to release one single. But then we, uh, Matt can talk to this one where we did uh, right before the album came out, like a week before we had a uh, VR uh, guy come in, this guy Ryan come in and make this rad video for We Love You. So we're like, OK, now we got to release a second single, kind of. But it was more of a just a fun way to get eyes on that song, I guess, or, you know, well, I'll, I'll let Matt take that part. Well, what, what's really going on is that the label has uh, boatloads of analytics and right. they know that if you put one single out, it just goes like this. And then the album comes out and it's a little bump and it's gone. And wow. they know that. So they'll show you, they'll sit there in the meeting with you and they'll tell you why you're wrong. And this is what, you know, God smacked did, and this is what Disturbed did, and this is what Metallica did, and here's their numbers. Every time they put out a single, it goes like this, and if you actually look at the greater sum, it's better than if you do what we did. Got you. And they're basically chasing the ambulance, right? They're just right. following data. It's what they say, care about. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, we know that people don't care about records that much anyways, so let's just hit them with these peaks before, and then we don't really care if the record gets ruined. I mean, maybe they're good people and maybe they do care, but they don't care in terms of keeping their job, right? Like yeah. we need to, we want to have as much play as possible. And I, I totally get it, but that's part of being, you know, in this sort of, um, it's sort of like Bino put it this way. Um, our manager, he said, it's kind of like being in a stream and you're this pebble and you're just getting pushed down the stream with everything else. Um, mm. Instead of being like this solid rock with a, an original idea or at least being able to live and die by your idea. Right. Like if our, if our record just completely tanked off at the, when it came out, it would be our choice and our fault. And you have to be okay with that. Right. right. Like what the way we did it. Um, I think there's no good answer right now. I think everybody's swimming in the muck. They're all trying to figure out a way to get eyes on their records. There's too much out there right now. There's, you know, I was in New York last time I was in New York. I went to the, um, the planetarium, but there's a lot of stuff next to it. And it started talking about after a certain amount of choices, humans don't know what to do with it. And it becomes all the same. And that's yeah. kind of where we're at with music. There's no real curators to kind of, there's no mic at bionic records necessarily. There is, but there's one bionic records. Now it's not everywhere. Um, there's no K rock. There's no, um, you know, pushing new music. There's no MTV. There's no curators now. So you have, everybody's on the playlist and it's impossible to kind of, figure out what's great and what's not. And you're in this situation now where you're trying to get any bit of attention you can. And I feel for those bands and the labels, but this, but like Johnny said, it's exciting because you don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. It's yeah, the yeah. freedom of knowing that it's not really going to matter. So just do whatever you want. And hopefully really cool art comes out of this instead of chasing the ambulance, you know? Yeah, so right. just, that's why people do it though. The analytics. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, you got a great record and I absolutely love it. I've said it all through the interview and I can't thank you enough for doing the show. And I hope to get to see you live and, and hear some of these songs live, you know, because it's it's a fantastic record and uh, you guys took a chance and fucking hit it out of the park, man. So thank, thank you. you. One last question, you guys, comedy fans. Yeah, I absolutely. You know, I am, Dean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't, I don't know how you can not be a comedy fan. I, I, <laughs> like stand I up. Love, like stand up. So, so here's, here's my situation. Whenever stand ups on or there's something on Netflix or whatever, I watch it and I love it. But I, yeah. I don't actively seek out comedy, which I, maybe I should. Yeah. We got to, we got to go up and we got to go up and check out Dean. He's a, he's a, he's a regular at, at the comedy store. Well, yeah. absolutely. Now, now that we know each other, of course, I got, I got to do it. I, I love it. 
Yeah, you got to come out. Uh, Bill and I did the Troubadour last night. That was pretty wild. Oh, oh the shit. Troubadour. That's awesome. With that's little cool. uh, surprise gig because we leave on tour uh, Wednesday. But uh, that was interesting to tell some jokes in that iconic venue. I pretty much have done all the rock venues now, you know, even the rainbow. They do comedy in the rainbow now upstairs in that, you know, that bar up there. Mm. Where they, have the yeah, dance yeah. In. they do comedy up there. So I've done the rainbow. I've done the Roxy, the whiskey, the Troubadour, the Fonda, the Will Turn, the Forum. You know, so I need the Hollywood Bowl. Have you guys done the Hollywood Bowl? We not I, not proper. We did a uh, we did the Scream Awards there, right? We played one song at the Scream Awards we, at the Hollywood, wait, at the Hollywood wait, Bowl. I, I did um I did some stuff at Lincoln Park there, but we that's right. Played. You did, yeah. We haven't played like a like a set there or anything. Well, thanks for we doing will. the show, and um, I, I appreciate it. Get this record, people. I know a lot of people listen to the show, and I've been pumping the record for two weeks now, and I can't tell you enough. Get this record, man. If you're into uh, like we say outside the box music you're gonna love this thing and uh great talking with you guys man thank you dean thank, thank you. you so much man really really great to meet you oh pleasure. yeah you too and i'm looking forward to uh seeing the tour somewhere I'll, I'll are the tour dates up on the website yeah 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 okay and you guys obviously have instagram and tick you guys doing tiktok i think management set one up for us <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think there's one set up. I don't think we've done anything with it. <laughs> there's a couple of videos. I don't know. It's so fucked, man. It's like, here we are, uh, like grown adults. Okay, I got my TikTok video. And yep. then I moved it to Instagram and I did the YouTube short. And then Twitter, I fought with some people over politics. Okay, I'm good today. <laughs> you know? That's totally good. Know. You got to play that oh, game God. with the podcasting too. It's you know, fucking you gotta, nuts. I got to put it on every fucking platform. It's crazy. Everything's a clip. Okay, I got it. Did you do a clip today? Fuck, man. I'm trying to fucking write some jokes or songs. <laughs> yeah, man. Clip. Yeah, oh. it's gnarly. Oh, God. All right. Thank you so much, guys. For yeah, doing thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a great one. Later. Later.